Track 29. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Track 29. The Third Epoch. 8. When I reached home again after my interview with Mrs. Clements, I was struck by the appearance of a change in Laura. The unvarying gentleness and patience which long misfortune had tried so cruelly, and had never conquered yet, seemed now to have suddenly failed her. Insensible to all Marian's attempts to soothe and amuse her, she sat with her neglected drawing, pushed away on the table, her eyes resolutely cast down, her fingers twining and untwining themselves restlessly in her lap. Marian rose when I came in, with a silent distress in her face, waited for a moment to see if Laura would look up at my approach, whispered to me, Try if you can rouse her, and left the room. I sat down in the vacant chair, gently unclasped the poor, worn, restless fingers, and took both her hands in mine. What are you thinking of, Laura? Tell me, my darling. Try and tell me what it is." She struggled with herself, and raised her eyes to mine. "'I can't feel happy,' she said. "'I can't help thinking,' she stopped, bent forward a little, and laid her head on my shoulder, with a terrible, mute helplessness that struck me to the heart. "'Try to tell me,' I repeated gently. "'Try to tell me why you are not happy.' "'I'm so useless. I'm such a burden on both of you," she answered, with a weary, hopeless sigh. "'You work and get money, Walter, and Marian helps you. Why is there nothing I can do? You'll end in liking Marian better than you like me. You will, because I'm so helpless. Oh, don't, don't, don't treat me like a child!' I raised her head, and soothed away the tangled hair that fell over her face, and kissed her. My poor faded flower, my lost, afflicted sister. You shall help us, Laura, I said. You shall begin, my darling, to-day. She looked at me with a feverish eagerness, with a breathless interest that made me tremble for the new life of hope which I had called into being by those few words. I rose, and set her drawing materials in order, and placed them near her again. "'You know that I work and get money by drawing,' I said. "'Now, you've taken such pains, now that you're so much improved, you shall begin to work and get money too. Try to finish this little sketch as nicely and prettily as you can. When it's done, I'll take it away with me, and the same person will buy it who buys all that I do. You shall keep your own earnings in your own purse, and Marian shall come to you to help us as often as she comes to me.' Think how useful you're going to make yourself to both of us, and you'll soon be as happy, Laura, as the day is long." Her face grew eager, and brightened into a smile. In the moment while it lasted, in the moment when she again took up the pencils that had been laid aside, she almost looked like the Laura of past days. I had rightly interpreted the first signs of a new growth and strength in her mind unconsciously expressing themselves in the notice that she had taken of the occupations which filled her sister's life and mine. Marian, when I told her what had passed, saw as I saw, that she was longing to assume her own little position of importance, to raise herself in her own estimation and in ours, and from that day we tenderly helped the new ambition which gave promise of the hopeful, happier future, that might now not be far off. Her drawings, as she finished them, or tried to finish them, were placed in my hands. Marian took them from me, and hid them carefully, and I set aside a little weekly tribute from my earnings, to be offered to her as the price paid by strangers for the poor, faint, valueless sketches, of which I was the only purchaser. It was hard, sometimes, to maintain our innocent deception, 
when she proudly brought out her purse to contribute her share towards the expenses, and wondered with serious interest whether I or she had earned the most that week. I have all those hidden drawings in my possession still. They are my treasures beyond price. The dear remembrances that I love to keep alive, the friends in past adversity that my heart will never part from, my tenderness never forget. Am I trifling here with the necessities of my task? Am I looking forward to the happier time which my narrative has not yet reached? Yes. Back again, back to the days of doubt and dread, when the spirit within me struggled hard for its life, in the icy stillness of perpetual suspense. I have paused and rested for a while on our onward course. It is not, perhaps, time wasted, if the friends who read these pages have paused and rested too. I took the first opportunity I could find of speaking to Marian in private, and of communicating to her the result of the inquiries which I had made that morning. She seemed to share the opinion on the subject of my proposed journey to Wilmingham, which Mrs. Clements had already expressed to me. Surely, Walter, she said, you hardly know enough yet to give you any hope of claiming Mrs. Catherick's confidence. Is it wise to proceed to these extremities before you have really exhausted all safer and simpler means of attaining your object? When you told me that Sir Percival and the Count were the only two people in existence who knew the exact date of Laura's journey, you forgot, and I forgot, that there was a third person who must surely know it. I mean Mrs. Rubell. Would it not be far easier and far less dangerous to insist on a confession from her than to force it from Sir Percival? It might be easier, I replied, but we are not aware of the full extent of Mrs. Rubell's connivance and interest in the conspiracy, and we are therefore not certain that the date has been impressed on her mind as it has been assuredly impressed on the minds of Sir Percival and the Count. It is too late now to waste the time of Mrs. Rubell, which may be all important to the discovery of the one assailable point in Sir Percival's life. Are you thinking a little too seriously, Marian, of the risk I may run in returning to Hampshire? Are you beginning to doubt whether Sir Percival Glyde may not in the end be more than a match for me? He will not be more than your match, she replied decidedly because he will not be helped in resisting you by the impenetrable wickedness of the Count. What led you to that conclusion? I replied, in some surprise. My own knowledge of Sir Percival's obstinacy and impatience of the Count's control, she answered. I believe he will insist on meeting you single-handed, just as he insisted at first on acting for himself at Blackwater Park. The time for suspecting the Count's interference will be the time when you have Sir Percival at your mercy. His own interests will then be directly threatened, and he will act, Walter, to terrible purpose in his own defence. We may deprive him of his weapons beforehand, I said. Some of the particulars I have heard from Mrs. Clements may yet be turned to account against him, and other means of strengthening the case may be at our disposal. There are passages in Mrs. Michelson's narrative which show that the Count found it necessary to place himself in communication with Mr. Fairley, and there may be circumstances which compromise him in that proceeding. While I am away, Marian, write to Mr. Fairley, and say that you want an answer describing exactly what passed between the Count and himself, and informing you also of any particulars that may have come to his knowledge at the same time in connection with his niece. Tell him that the statement you request will sooner or later be insisted on if he shows any reluctance to furnish you with it of his own accord. The letter should be written, Walter. But are you really determined to go to Wilmingham? Absolutely determined. I will devote the next two days to earning what we want for the week to come, and on the third day I go to Hampshire. When the third day came I was ready for my journey. As it was possible that I might be absent for some little time, I arranged with Marian that we were to correspond every day, of course addressing each other by assumed names for caution's sake. As long as I heard from her regularly, I should assume that nothing was wrong. 
but if the morning came and brought me no letter my return to london would take place as a matter of course by the first train i contrived to reconcile laura to my departure by telling her that i was going to the country to find new purchases for her drawings and for mine and left her occupied and happy marian followed me downstairs to the street door remember what anxious hearts you leave here she whispered as we stood together in the passage remember all the hopes that hang on your safe return if strange things happen to you on this journey if you and sir percival meet what makes you think we shall meet i asked i don't know i have fears and fancies that i cannot account for laugh at them walter if you like but for god's sake keep your temper if you come in contact with that man never fear marian i answer for my self-control with those words we parted i walked briskly to the station there was a glow of hope in me there was a growing conviction in my mind that my journey this time would not be taken in vain it was a fine clear cold morning my nerves were firmly strung and i felt all the strength of my resolution stirring in me vigorously from head to foot as i crossed the railway platform and looked right and left among the people congregated on it to search for any faces among them that i knew the doubt occurred to me whether it might not have been to my advantage if i had adopted a disguise before setting out for hampshire but there was something so repellent to me in the idea something so meanly like the common herd of spies and informers in the mere act of adopting a disguise that i dismissed the question from consideration almost as soon as it had arisen in my mind even as a mere matter of expediency the proceeding was doubtful in the extreme if i tried the experiment at home the landlord of the house would sooner or later discover me and would have his suspicions aroused immediately and if i tried it away from home the same persons might see me by the commonest accident with the disguise and without it and i should in that way be inviting the notice and distrust which it was my most pressing interest to avoid in my own character I had acted thus far, and in my own character I was resolved to continue to the end. The train left me at Wilmingham early in the afternoon. Is there any wilderness of sand in the deserts of Arabia? Is there any prospect of desolation among the ruins of Palestine which can rival the repelling effect on the eye and the depressing influence on the mind of an English country town in the first stage of its existence and in the transition state of its prosperity i asked myself that question as i passed through the clean desolation the neat ugliness the prim torpor of the streets of welling and the tradesmen who stared after me from their lonely shops the trees that drooped helpless in their arid exile of unfinished crescents and squares the dead house carcasses that waited in vain for the vivifying human element to animate them with the breath of life every creature that i saw every object that i passed seemed to answer with one accord the deserts of arabia are innocent of our civilized desolation the ruins of palestine are incapable of our modern gloom i inquired my way to the quarter of the town in which mrs catherick lived and on reaching it found myself in a square of small houses one story high there was a bare little plot of grass in the middle protected by cheap wire fence an elderly nursemaid and two children were standing in a corner of the enclosure looking at a lean goat tethered to the grass two foot passengers were talking together on one side of the pavement before the houses and an idle little boy was leading an idle little dog along by a string on the other I heard the dull tinkling of a piano in the distance, accompanied by the intermittent knocking of a hammer nearer at hand. These were all the sights and sounds of life that encountered me when I entered the square. I walked at once to the door of number 13, the number of Mrs. Catherick's house, and knocked, without waiting to consider beforehand how I might best present myself when I got in. The first necessity was to see Mrs. Catherick. I could then judge from my own observation of the safest and easiest manner to approach the object of my visit. The door was opened by a melancholy middle-aged woman servant. I gave her my card, and asked if I could see Mrs. Catherick. The card was taken into the front parlour, 
and the servant returned with a message requesting me to mention what my business was. "'Say, if you please, that my business relates to Mrs. Catherick's daughter,' I replied. This was the best pretext I could think of, on the spur of the moment, to account for my visit. The servant again retired to the parlour, again returned, and this time begged me, with a look of gloomy amazement, to walk in. I entered a little room with a flaring paper of the largest pattern on the walls. Chairs, tables, chiffonier, sofa, all gleamed with the glutinous brightness of cheap upholstery. On the largest table in the middle of the room stood a smart Bible, placed exactly in the centre of a red and yellow woollen mat, and at the side of the table nearest to the window, with a little knitting basket on her lap and a wheezing, blear-eyed old spaniel crouched at her feet, there sat an elderly woman, wearing a black net cap and a black silk gown, and having slate-coloured mittens on her hands. Her iron-grey hair hung in heavy bands on either side of her face. Her dark eyes looked straight forward with a hard, defiant, implacable stare. She had full, square cheeks and a long, firm chin, and thick, sensual, colourless lips. Her figure was stout and sturdy, and her manner aggressively self-possessed. This was Mrs. Catherick. "'You have come to speak to me about my daughter,' she said, before I could utter a word on my side. "'Be so good as to mention what you have to say.' The tone of her voice was hard, as defiant, as implacable as the expression of her eyes. She pointed to a chair, and looked me all over attentively from head to foot, as I sat down in it. I saw that my only chance with this woman was to speak to her in her own tone, and to meet her at the outset of our interview on her own ground. "'You are aware,' I said, "'that your daughter has been lost. I am perfectly aware of it. Have you felt any apprehension that the misfortune of her loss might be followed by the misfortune of her death?" "'Yes. Have you come here to tell me she is dead?' "'I have.' "'Why?' She put that extraordinary question without the slightest change in her voice, her face, or her manner. She could not have appeared more perfectly unconcerned if I had told her of the death of the goat in the enclosure outside. "'Why?' I repeated. Do you ask why I come here to tell you of your daughter's death?" Yes. What interest have you in me or in her? How do you come to know anything about my daughter? In this way. I met her on the night when she escaped from the asylum, and I assisted her in reaching a place of safety. You did very wrong. I am sorry to hear her mother say so. Her mother does say so. How do you know she is dead? I am not at liberty to say how I know it, but I do know it. Are you at liberty to say how you found out my address? Certainly. I got your address from Mrs. Clements. Mrs. Clements is a foolish woman. Did she tell you to come here? She did not. Then I ask you again, why did you come? As she was determined to have her answer, I gave it to her in the plainest possible form. I came, I said because I thought Anne Catherick's mother might have some natural interest in knowing whether she was alive or dead. Just so, said Mrs. Catherick, with additional self-possession. Had you no other motive? I hesitated. The right answer to that question was not easy to find at a moment's notice. If you have no other motive, she went on, deliberately taking off her slate-coloured mittens and rolling them up, I have only to thank you for your visit, and to say that I will not detain you here any longer. Your information would be more satisfactory if you were willing to explain how you became possessed of it. However, it justifies me, I suppose, in going into mourning. There is not much alteration necessary in my dress, as you can see. When I have changed my mittens, I shall be all in black." She searched in the pocket of her gown, drew out a pair of black lace mittens, put them on with the stoniest and steadiest composure, and then quietly crossed her hands in her lap. "'I wish you good morning,' she said. The cool contempt of her manner irritated me into directly avowing that the purpose of my visit had not been answered yet. "'I have another purpose in coming here,' I said. 
"'Ah, I thought so,' remarked Mrs. Catherick. "'Your daughter's death. What did she die of?' "'Of a disease of the heart. Yes, go on.' Your daughter's death has been made the pretext for inflicting serious injury on a person who is very dear to me. Two men have been concerned, to my certain knowledge, in doing that wrong. One of them is Sir Percival Glyde. Indeed. I looked attentively, to see if she flinched at the sudden mention of that name. Not a muscle of her stirred. The hard, defiant, implacable stare in her eyes never wavered for an instant. You may wonder, I went on how the event of your daughter's death can have been made the means of inflicting injury on another person. No, said Mrs. Catherick. I don't wonder at all. This appears to be your affair. You are interested in my affairs. I am not interested in yours. You may ask, then, I persisted, why I mention the matter in your presence. Yes, I do ask that. I mention it because I am determined to bring Sir Percival Glyde to account for the wickedness he has committed. And what do I have to do with your determination? You shall hear. There are certain events in Sir Percival's past which it is necessary for my purpose to be fully acquainted with. You know them, and for that reason I come to you. What events do you mean? Events that occurred in Old Welmingham when your husband was parish clerk of that place, before the time when your daughter was born. I had reached the woman at last through the barrier of impenetrable reserve that she had tried to set up between us. I saw her temper smouldering in her eyes, as plainly as I saw her hands grow restless, then unclasp themselves, and begin mechanically smoothing her dress over her knees. "'What do you know of those events?' she asked. "'All that Mrs. Clements could tell me,' I answered. There was a momentary flush on her firm, square face a momentary stillness in her restless hands, which seemed to betoken a coming outburst of anger that might throw her off her guard. But no. She mastered the rising irritation, leaned back in her chair, crossed her arms on her broad bosom, and, with a smile of grim sarcasm on her thick lips, looked at me as steadily as ever. "'Ah! I begin to understand it all now,' she said her tamed and disciplined anger only expressing itself in the elaborate mockery of her tone and manner. You have got a grudge of your own against Sir Percival Glyde, and I must help you wreak it. I must tell you this. That and the other about Sir Percival and myself, must I? Yes, indeed. You've been prying into my private affairs. You think you've found a lost woman to deal with, who lives here on sufferance, and who will do anything you ask for fear you may injure her in the opinions of the townspeople. I see through you and your precious speculation. I do, and it amuses me. Ha, ha! She stopped for a moment. Her arms tightened over her bosom, and she laughed to herself, a hard, harsh, angry laugh. You don't know how I've lived in this place. What I've done in this place, Mr. What's-Your-Name, she went on, I'll tell you before I ring the bell and have you shown out. I came here a wronged woman. I came here robbed of my character and determined to claim it back. I have been years and years about it, and I have claimed it back. I have matched the respectable people fairly and openly on their own ground. If they say anything against me now, they must say it in secret. They can't say it. They daren't say it openly. I stand high enough in this town to be out of your reach. The clergyman bows to me. Ha, ha! You didn't bargain for that when you came here. Go to the church and inquire about me. You will find Mrs. Catherick has her sitting like the rest of them, and pays her rent on the day it's due. Go to the town hall. There's a petition lying there, a petition of the respectable inhabitants against allowing a circus to come and perform here to corrupt our morals, yes, our morals. I signed that petition this morning. Go to the bookseller's shop. The clergyman's Wednesday evening lectures on justification by faith are publishing there by subscription. I am down on the list. The doctor's wife only put a shilling in the plate at our last charity sermon. I put half a crown. Mr. Churchwarden Soward held the plate and bowed to me. Ten years ago he told Pigram, the chemist, that I ought to be whipped out of the town on a cart's tail. Is your mother alive? Has she got a better Bible on her table than I have got on mine? Does she stand better with her tradespeople than I do with mine? 
has she always lived within her income i have always lived within mine ah there is the clergyman coming along the square look mr what's your name look if you please she started up with the activity of a young woman and went to the window waited till the clergyman passed and bowed to him solemnly the clergyman ceremoniously raised his hat and walked on mrs catherick returned to her chair and looked at me with a grimmer sarcasm than ever there she said what do you think of that for a woman with a lost character how does your speculation look now the singular manner in which she had chosen to assert herself the extraordinary practical vindication of her position in the town which she had just offered had so perplexed me that i listened to her in silent surprise i was not the less resolved however to make another effort to throw her off her guard if the woman's fierce temper once got beyond her control and once flamed out on me she might yet say the words which could put a clue in my hands how does your speculation look now she repeated exactly as it looked when i first came in i answered i don't doubt the position you have gained in the town and i don't wish to assail it even if i could i came here because sir percival glyde is to my certain knowledge your enemy as well as mine if i have a grudge against him you have a grudge against him too you may deny it if you like you may distrust me as much as you please you may be as angry as you will but of all the women in england you if you have any sense of injury are the woman who ought to help me crush that man crush him for yourself she said then come back here and see what i say to you she spoke those words as she had not spoken yet quickly fiercely vindictively i had stirred in its lair the serpent hatred of years but only for a moment like a lurking reptile it leaped up at me as she eagerly bent forward towards the place in which i was sitting like a lurking reptile it dropped out of sight again as she instantly resumed her former position in the chair you won't trust me i said no you are afraid do i look as if i was you are afraid of sir percival glyde am i her colour was rising her hands were at work again smoothing her gown i pressed the point further and further home i went on without allowing her a moment of delay sir percival has a high position in the world i said it would be no wonder if you were afraid of him sir percival is a powerful man a baronet the possessor of a fine estate and a descendant of a great family she amazed me beyond expression by suddenly bursting out laughing yes she repeated in tones of the bitterest steadiest contempt a baronet the possessor of a fine estate the descendant of a great family yes indeed a great family especially by the mother's side there was no time to reflect on the words that had just escaped her there was only time to feel that they were well worth thinking over the moment i left the house i am not here to dispute with you about family questions i said i know nothing of sir percival's mother and you know as little of sir percival himself she interposed sharply i advise you not to be too sure of that i rejoined i know some things about him and i suspect many more what do you suspect i'll tell you what i don't suspect i don't suspect him of being anne's father she started to her feet and came close up to me with a look of fury how dare you talk to me about anne's father how dare you say who was her father and who wasn't she broke out her face quivering her voice trembling with passion the secret between you and sir percival is not that secret i persisted the mystery which darkens sir percival's life was not born with your daughter's birth and has not died with your daughter's death she drew back a step go she said and pointed sternly to the door there was no thought of the child in your heart or his i went on determined to press her back to her last defences there was no bond of guilty love between you and him when you held those stolen meetings when your husband found you whispering together under the vestry of the church her pointing hand instantly dropped to her side and the deep flush of anger from her face while i spoke i saw the change pass over her i saw that hard firm fearless self-possessed woman quail under a terror 
which her utmost resolution was not strong enough to resist when I said those last five words. The vestry of the church. For a minute or more we stood looking at each other in silence. I spoke first. Do you still refuse to trust me? I asked. She could not call the colour that had left it back to her face, but she steadied her voice, and she recovered the defiant self-possession of her manner when she answered me. I do refuse, she said. Do you still tell me to go? Yes. Go and never come back. I walked to the door, waited a moment before I opened it, and turned around to look at her again. I may have news to bring you of Sir Percival which you don't expect, I said. In that case I shall come back. There is no news of Sir Percival that I don't expect except— She stopped. Her pale face darkened, and she stole back with a quiet, stealthy, cat-like step to her chair. Except the news of his death, she said, sitting down again with the mockery of a smile just hovering on her cruel lips, and the furtive light of hatred lurking deep in her steady eyes. As I opened the door of the room to go out, she looked round at me quickly. The cruel smile slowly widened her lips. She eyed me with a strange, stealthy interest from head to foot. An unutterable expectation showed itself wickedly all over her face. Was she speculating in the secrecy of her own heart? On my youth and strength, on the force of my sense of injury, and the limits of my self-control, and was she considering the lengths to which they might carry me, if Sir Percival and I ever chanced to meet? The bare doubt that it might be so drove me from her presence, and silenced even the common forms of farewell on my lips. Without a word more on my side or on hers, I left the room. As I opened the outer door I saw the same clergyman who had already passed the house once, about to pass it again, on his way back through the square. I waited on the doorstep to let him go by, and looked round, as I did so, at the parlour window. Mrs. Catherick had heard his footsteps approaching, in the silence of that lonely place, and she was on her feet at the window again, waiting for him. Not all the strength of all the terrible passions I had aroused in that woman's heart could loosen her desperate hold on the one fragment of social consideration which years of resolute effort had just dragged within her grasp. There she was again, not a minute after I had left her, placed purposely in a position which made it a matter of common courtesy on the part of the clergyman to bow to her for a second time. He raised his hat once more. I saw the hard, ghastly face behind the window soften, and light up with gratified pride. I saw the head with the grim black cap bend ceremoniously in return. The clergyman had bowed to her, and in my presence, twice in one day. End of track twenty nine.